Am I wired? Yes, I'm wired. Okay. G uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Laura Tyson, and I'm going to moderate this uh, panel. Um, and we're going to uh, start and end on time. Um, and we have an extremely important uh, topic, and uh, one with not without controversy, uh, compensating leaders, uh, a cross-cultural view. We were talking before. Actually, you can start with cross-cultural differences in what a leader actually is, uh, and then talk about uh, the cross-cultural differences in compensation. Uh, we have a very uh, distinguished panel. Let me just uh, introduce each one of them. Uh, as keeping with tradition here, what we've agreed to do is have each panelist uh, give a couple of uh, bullet points on the general question we've all been asked to consider. We've all been asked to consider the general question of how is uh, how do different societies, uh, different countries, different companies uh, reward leadership? And the agenda also says reproach leadership. That means what do you do with leadership when it is not succeeding? So we've all been thinking about that question and thinking about it in a cross-cultural context. So we have with us on the panel Jack Dunn, who's the president and CEO of FTI Consulting, a global advisory services company uh, serving corporate clients around the world. Uh, we have Madhu Kanan, the uh, managing director and CEO of uh, BSE LTD Inc. That's the Bombay Stock Exchange Exchange Group, uh, very responsible for uh, developing the capability of trading in sophisticated financial products uh, in India. We have Rafael Gil Tienda, the chairman Asia of Marsh and McLennan. Uh, you know that firm, I'm sure. Global Advisory, Risk Strategy, Human Capital. Oki Matsumoto, the chairman and CEO of Monix Group, a technology-based online retail financial services company. A very interesting background coming from a well-known global financial services company to an entrepreneur uh, in Japan. And finally, John Strackhaus, senior partner, Hydric and Struggles. Hydric obviously is involved in search talent, leadership, compensation all of the time. So I will start, and we'll just start with a couple of opening comments in alphabetical order. So I'll start with Jack. Thank you very much. Uh, in our instructions today, we were told to talk about the issue on a fact-based, dispassionate, and analytical basis. In, uh, <laughs> The U.S. at this time, that's like trying to describe a ice cream sundae without talking about whipped cream or chocolate sauce. Hardly is the issue of executive <laughs> compensation ever spoken of without the adjectives of outrageous or unfair, and statistics and factoids like the CEO pay is now an average of 343 times uh, worker pay. Um, or that the 25, in 25 major companies in the U.S., the CEOs made an average of $16 million while the companies paid no taxes. So it's hard to talk about it on a dispassionate basis. I think if I look at it from the U.S. perspective, one of the major factors is the factor of time. In, since in 1969, no, excuse, 1969, the average holding by a mutual fund institution in a uh, U.S. equity was six years. In 2009, that time frame was 69 days. CEO tenure has gone from 10 years to 8 years in 2000 to 6 years in 2010. Velocity leads to bringing in people from the outside. And when you hire people from the outside, there's a tendency to match the highest that they could have made in their prior performance as opposed to what the reality of the job might be. In our country, it's typical for us to hire a compensation consultant who will then bless the arrangement, which then raises the median pay for all CEOs, so we get somewhat of a vicious cycle. The icing or the whipped cream is then some academic does a study that is outraged by all the bells and whistles of, perk, of perks, which three out of ten compensation committees take as a lesson on how to improve executive pay and 10 out of 10 executives take as a checklist for what they should ask for in their next negotiation. So I think <laughs> a lot of the criticism of executive pay is well-deserved, but I think the issues and the factors that go into that are more complicated than they might appear just on the surface. Thank you. 
So one of the things that uh, Jack mentioned and one of the things we discussed is that different companies, different ownership structures are going to affect this. So you're really talking about publicly traded companies where we have these uh, institutional investors that are moving in and out. It's really changed everything. That's, a, I think, a very, very important point. Raphael, why don't I turn to you? Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Laura. Um, I'm going to comment primarily on uh, the role and compensation of independent non-executive directors. Okay. Um, besides my role at Marshall McLennan, I've been an independent director at the Chinese bank for the last eight years, and I sit on the compensation committee. I won't talk about that, but I will talk about uh, the broad uh, issue in Asia. And the reason why I wanted to focus on independent directors is that both in the West and increasingly in the East, independent directors are the majority of the compensation committee that determines the compensation of the senior executive. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, how is that selected? How is that compensated itself? In the U.S., you have very strong non-executives that are compensated very highly, say at the $200,000 U.S. dollar level plus stock options. In Europe, you have less use of stock options, but you have even higher levels of uh, compensation, more... 200,000 euro to 300,000 euro. You move that to Asia, and even Hong Kong, which has been, I think, an example of superior corporate governance in Asia, independent directors mm -hmm. get compensated very little. Uh -huh. Okay, you have pays of 100,000 Hong Kong dollars, say 15,000 US dollars, right. at the high level, 300,000 mm -hmm. Hong Kong dollars, which is, say, 30, 40,000 dollars. So what ends up happening is that the large companies that are listed tend to hire either local tycoons or friends, friends. or they become a sinecure for old employees right. that more or less rubber stamp right. the, the, the board. This is even more exaggerated here in the mainland, where compensation is at the 50,000 renminbi, 100,000 renminbi, maybe 150, 200,000 renminbi level. So what one of, I wanted to, maybe we can come back to this, but I wanted to close by saying that in Asia, one of the difficulties is to bring in experienced, committed, independent, non -ex that will really perform an independent role in assessing management and its performance. It's very, very interesting. Um, I, I want to tie these two things together in, in, in one respect, which is that uh, in, the, in the U.S. and probably in Europe as well, where there is now quite rigorous, transparent selection of independent directors. Yes. So we've moved way beyond this issue of friends. and. Right. Uh, but even then, even then, if you choose a, f a former CEO from another company to be an independent director, this upward sort of right. spiral of every CEO looking at the standard of pay based on their experience. So an right. independent director CEO will say, well, in my company, when I was CEO, this is what I received. So even then, it's complicated. Yes, I agree. <laughs> yes. I agree, Laura. Uh, Madhu Kanan? Thanks, Laura. You know, I'll sort of restrict my comments mainly on India, which is sort of uh, where I'm spending all my time on. Um, clearly, there's a war for talent going on uh, in, in India as, as to, to, to sort of uh, fuel the growth. Uh, one point, uh, Jack, uh, one of the recent numbers I've seen in terms of the CEO compensation, as a, uh, it's roughly between 70 to 100 times that of an average worker. So it's the, it's not as, the difference is not as big as it is in the Western world. But because, of the, uh, because there's a lot of demand um, and, and there's a reasonable amount of limited supply coming into the market, you're seeing usual trends like you know, salary growth of around 14%, which is almost twice the average globally. Uh, attrition rates are at around 19-20% and, and, um, and there's clearly a, sort of a, a mismatch that's happening uh, in, 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 the, in, in the labor market. Um, now, in the, from a philosophy perspective, from, if you look at the, the corporate sector in the country, I would sort of go along with maybe, maybe the point you made. You've got to, you, know, you can't look at the country homo homogeneously. You've got to look at companies basically based on the sectors they're in. I think the compensation philosophy, let's say, in the manufacturing space is very different from the services space which may be very different from, a, from, 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 a, from, let's say, other spaces. And the second way to differentiate is the ownership structure of the companies. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the government-owned, the, the quasi-public uh, entities have got a very different sort of a compensation structure where 
I think the fixed compensation is 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 reasonably limited, and there's a lot of lot of perks. Uh, and and uh, whereas, when you contrast that with, let's say, private companies, and you can differentiate between private companies which which don't have an foreign investor uh, and and those that have a foreign investor foreign or too. private companies that are actually or, or privately private companies that are actually listed or not listed and you find compensation philosophies different across these things these two categories as well for those that have either are listed i think clearly the pressure from the investors is clearly for, forcing um, compensations to be a uh, disclosed and also to be to be also more in line with global global standards. So I think that's one trend which we need to look at. Um, I think a couple of more sort of factors I'll, I'll put out here is uh, which I you know having worked in the US for 13 years and going back and taking this job. One thing that sh you know transparency is, is important, but lack of confidentiality is also a big problem at the middle management level. Uh -huh. So and that becomes an, 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 an issue, and that also explains the attrition problem. Because today I go and get hired by company X for paying and getting paid ten thousand dollars. Because there's so much openness of data, I, if somebody else pays me ten thousand five hundred, I'm going to flip at, at, the, at the at the at the lower level. And um, and 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 from from a regulatory perspective, the, the the government and and the regulators are trying very hard to dry, to a get, get more transparency and also are trying to put in sort of caps, let's say on 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 how much. One can pay uh, and and full time CEO or, 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 or on 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 the board of the company and linking it to the profits of the company. Now whether it's right or wrong, it's linking, linking. Yeah, linking it and and that has some problems for companies that are in in pre profit mode, and that's a different question we can talk about. But this is sort of broadly what's happening in the country. But you know, it is a big issue which which we as an, as, a, as a nation are, are are trying to grapple with. Interesting. Let's turn to uh, a, a perspective from Japan, Oki, which you, you, and you've had experience with both a large a Western multinational uh, firm in financial services and your own firm in Japan. Well, uh, I have never studied or lived in outside of Japan, but mm -hmm. I, I joined the uh, U.S. Investment Bank uh, and I became partner there. And then 12 years ago, I created my own company, which is a Japanese company, Recently, I acquired a U.S. listed online broker as our subsidiary. So I've gone through many of those situations. And I have seen, the, uh, before the occasion, I have seen that uh, the, how do you say, the core characteristics of CEO of the, uh, at least Japanese company and U.S. companies are quite different. In Japan, the CEO is a more like a big brother of employees. And in the States, the CEO is someone who was, how do you say, trusted by the investors or shareholders to manage the company. It's very different. Mm -hmm. So in Japan, when the merger happens, the CEO tends to refuse to fire people because they are the, the big brother of employees. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Japan, the CEO is usually selected as the new graduate becomes a manager, manager becomes general manager, and who becomes the kind of executive, and then become to the, uh, the top executive. So in Japan, uh, we try to grow a cat to a tiger. <laughs> and it never happens, you know. The cat is cat, and in the States, it, it, you know, maybe you know, they try to hire a, a tiger baby, Mm -hmm. or tiger itself to run the company. Right, okay? right. And we try to grow a cat into to be a tiger. It, it, it won't work. <laughs> but we don't pay a lot for a cat. Okay? <laughs> and uh, and uh, I guess the uh, you know, US pays a lot for tiger. Uh, I want to calculate the, the comparison. Who pays what? Uh, in Europe, uh, people pay, say, uh, uh, 500 dollars per, per kilogram of Ferrari or, or, or Aston Martin, okay? uh, which Americans don't do. Mm -hmm. We in Japan, we pay $500 per kilogram of tuna, mm -hmm. which Americans don't do. Right. You pay uh, maybe $50,000 per kilogram of, for CEO, which, <laughs> <laughs> which, which we don't do in Japan. <laughs> so it, it's big difference uh, in the, it's big difference in the, uh, I think that all coming from the, how do you say, the core Core role of core role. CEO is yeah. very core different role. in Japan and in the States, for example. Mm -hmm. but, but relate that to the ownership structure a minute, because uh, these the large 
Japanese companies that we're talking about are publicly traded mm -hmm. companies. So why uh, is it because their investors do not have as much influence in the CEO selection? Is because their investors are more long-term investors and therefore they're not in the situation that we heard from about at the beginning, which is just turning over the stock and turning over the CEOs? And I think it's more former than latter. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, we in Japan should, if, if Japan want to change that, uh, Japan should get more investors' voice involved in CEO selection. Okay. Uh, I'm on the board of Tokyo Stock Exchange as well, mm -hmm. and I'm talking to the exchange to cha uh, try to change the rule uh, because, you know, the, in Japan, for the shareholders' meeting, the current management create a list of new board members yes. for the, for the voted, to, vo voted in the shareholders' meeting. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a lengthy list. Mm -hmm. And the shareholders meeting, it's kind of no way that to be rejected. Mm -hmm. And once that the list of the board members are, are, are approved, then they pick CEO among themselves, mm -hmm. among those board of directors. And they are basically brothers, right? So again, so the CEO tend to do the, the decision uh, good for employees, not for good shareholders. Members. Okay. All right. John, you are involved in a lot of CEO searches. I, I would have thought it in, I'm going to say something about U.S. companies, which is I think, you know, they do searches for CEOs, but oftentimes, I mean, the searches are, uh, I guess the question is, the key issue is how does a candidate get on that list, okay? Here's a company, it's publicly traded, the shareholders have influence, it needs a new CEO, it goes to Hydrogen Struggles, uh, tell us more about what you hear from the companies and what, how it might differ from what we've just heard about Japan. Well, I think, I think that uh, in the U.S. they're fairly aggressive. If they're not performing, you know, they will, they will quietly go out to search. And so, uh, you know, we'll typically get that call. And at that point, we'll have to kind of do a very analytical research of the market to be able to come up with the right set of skills. And there's models that we use to do that. In terms of my background, I'm former president of a company up in Canada, and uh, by, by way of background, I've done most of the top leadership positions at the World Economic Forum for Professor Schwab. And I also work very closely with, uh, and Dolores helped me over the years. I also work very closely with uh, John Doerr, uh, who's recognized by Forbes as number one investor in the week, Google and Amazon and a number of other great companies like Bloom. Laura's on the board of Silver Spring with Ben Court Lang. Uh, Bill Joy is another gentleman that's just like working with Einstein. He, he's, he's the founder of Sun Microsystem. So I think that when you look at compensation in companies and compensation of executives, it's broken out in five categories. To get to Laura's question, yes, if you're a, in a major corporation, it's usually uh, broken out into, uh, for, the, for the executives, it's base salary, bonus, long-term incentives. And what they try and do is, is you know, the average pay of a, of a Fortune 500 CEO is in the, in the $20 million range. That's typically what you see. The second category of, of, of executive compensation is private equity, and that's a, that's a pretty pervasive uh, asset class today. What you're seeing CEOs get paid when they go into a private equity-backed business. Now, a private equity business is defined by established EBITDA. They come in, they use that EBITDA to harvest cash, to increase the ownership, and then they create an exit. In that asset class, what you typically find is an ownership structure of anywhere from 2 to 4%. Um, and that's not that high a risk. The highest risk asset class in the world is venture capital. And this is where the great company builders like the John Doors or the Bill Joys or other you know, assets like Bain or you go around the list. What they typically do is they incent their management team with a high percentage of ownership. So typically a CEO will get anywhere from 5 to 8% ownership going in the door depending on where they are. Is it a Series A, Series B, Series C? When are they making the change? They usually allocate about 20% of the stock. And I think what you see in compensation models, particularly for venture capital-backed businesses, are heavily weighted towards equity, very low cash, and they'll exec you know, it's not unusual to take an executive from $2 million down to $200,000, but they're going to get a big ownership stake. Mm -hmm. uh, the fourth category would be privately owned businesses, and that's you know, a major part of, of the global economy around the world, whether, whether you go to India, China. Brazil, United States, privately owned businesses are typically compensating their executives primarily in cash, 
They're not in the public markets, and they, and they do try and retain them by having you know, cash and long-term incentives, but they don't have access to equity. And so there's a lot of benefits to being in family offices that are pretty attractive. I think the fifth category that's, that's really, really quite, quite pervasive in many countries are state-owned enterprises, particularly in China. Um, that's a huge part of the uh, macroeconomic trends in many, of, many parts of, of China. It was interesting, when I did a search for John Doerr to recruit the top executive out of China, um, the gentleman was competing against the top, top there were 70 companies in, in China in the wind turbine industry. The top three were all state-owned enterprises. Yep. And so they are very powerful, they're significant, and they represent a major part of the economy. So those are the five categories. Now, what we're seeing in terms of trends in Asia Pacific, and we, and we define Asia Pacific as China, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, and Malaysia, the contributing factors on compensation continue to be strong growth of the Asian industrial GDP, which is accelerating inflation across the region, creating a scarcity of executive talent, and, di and there's a real significant difficulty in recruiting executives into these key positions in this region. Mm -hmm. Now, what we're seeing in terms of averages, and this is what I want to share with you. While the average salaries are increasing, increasing in this region by 7%, they're increasing higher in India and China than they are in Europe or North America. The, the comparable averages in North America and Europe are 2 to 3%. And what you're seeing is there's going to be a crossover where, you know, right now Asian executives are getting paid more than European executives. Um, and in two to three years, you will see uh, Asian executives get paid more than American executives. So... Those are the trends that Hydrogen Struggles are seeing in the market. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, we've actually uh, been extremely well as a panel in terms of getting, I think, a major set of issues out there, and we have a lot of time for Q&A. We can engage ourselves, but I would actually like to turn right to the audience and see if we can engage you uh, in some of these issues. Are there any? Yeah. And I think, uh, please identify yourself. I think that's what we do here. Yeah, uh, good morning. I'm uh, Vincent van Quickenborn. I'm Minister of Economy of Belgium. I'm also a YGL, like our friend Canaan. Okay. Um, uh, two questions. First of all, you say uh, the average compensation is $20 million for the top 500 US. companies, U.S.? Yes. U.S. CEO. Yeah, US, US CEO. I, CEO. I'm sorry, I'm a free market liberal. I'm not a left-wing guy. What can you do with 20 million euros every year or 20 million dollars? Don't you think that is exaggerated? I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry to say That's so, but I mean, question. this is a, I mean, more and more to my electorate in Belgium or in Europe, I mean, these kind of questions come up. And five years ago, I said, That's the free market, man. That's how it goes. And today, I think about values. So the question is, do you think you can defend that thing? And second, my second question is, I'm in favor of bonuses as long as a system of malices exists. Do, do you see, have you ever met a CEO that has a system of malice, that bonus, when you do it well, you get more, when it's bad, you get down. So, I mean, that's the, the stick and the carrot. Does it exist somewhere, or what do you think about it? That's a very, we, yes, we haven't talked here about the issue of reproach, or, or uh, and can I just uh, say that I, in, in the question about level, so you just heard uh, that uh, it's quite possible that in the next few years, the compensation in Asia will exceed the compensation uh, in the U.S. So the $20 million uh, figure may actually be topped, uh, not as an average, perhaps. But um, anyway, what to, uh, uh, let's get some responses from the, from the panel. Since you raised the number, why don't you start? <laughs> Since you revealed that number, I think you should start. Well, <laughs> first off... I'm not sure that I agree with how these guys get paid. And I'm at the market and I see it. And, I, and, and I've, seen, I've, seen, you know, I've seen executives where you know, I walk in, sit down with the board, and uh, the executive has an 8 to 1 ratio. For every $8 of acquisitions that he made, he has $1 left of shareholder value. And he's still asking the board for more money. So at some point, you know, good sense has to, has to be you know, brought to the table. Uh, I, I see that the, the significant wealth creation is in other asset classes. And, and I think that, that boards have to you know, get their compensation models aligned with the reality. I mean, in Europe, I mean, you don't have the same excesses. All right? 
Um, the co-CEO of SAP is our placement. He doesn't get that kind of money. I mean, it's much more sensible in Germany, much more sensible in the UK, much more sensible. It's, it's, it's a problem in the US. And I think it's one that, uh, that you know, doesn't serve the shareholders well sometimes because they're, you know, they're caught up in making short-term decisions to optimize their personal economics. And uh, I find it egregious. So, so I don't disagree with, with your point. And I, I think, I think you know, we're onto something. I think boards need to you know, really, really start to take a hard look at that and really start to look at the differential between the top of the house and what the CEO is getting paid and what, what the lowest, lowest labor is getting, you know, getting paid. So I think, I, you know, it has to be, it's just kind of unconscionable that when you have that level of greed driving performance, driving behavior, and that's what, you know, when you look at, at, at the macroeconomic trends, this financial crisis of 2008, it takes five to seven years for, uh, you know, the economy to heal when you have that kind of uh, harm done. So I, I've seen it up close and personal, and, and I, think, I, think you're, I think you raised a very good point. Yes, Kip. Yeah, uh, Laura, I, to go back to the question on the quantum, okay, uh, the... The um, situation in Asia is really quite diverse and kind of complicated in, in, in addressing your question. Uh, I think in Japan, there is a requirement to maintain disclosure above $1 million. So in all of Japan, my understanding is that there are only 300 executives that make over a $1 million. Okay? You're coming over to this country, and there is a limitation by the CBRC in financial services, the, the, the banking regulator and also in ministry that uh, out of the, say, 2,000 listed companies in China, about 70-80% are state-controlled. And in there, the maximum compensation tends to be about 4 million renminbi, which is half a million U.S. You move that to the private sector, the Chinese private sector, and then, of course, it can be a lot more of a mirror of the United States, where, you know, a, uh, say... Uh, a global manufacturer of PCs, you know, the, his compensation was about 10 million U.S. So you're getting this diversity, and in fact, the growth is in the private sector in China rather than in the SOE-controlled uh, listed companies, which creates this also tension because of the comment you made earlier on, uh, John, that uh, there is a lure to attract good, gov uh, good uh, executives in China from the SOEs into the private sector, but they're taking much more risk. If you're in an SOE, you have much more of a guarantee. The malus is less of, okay, uh, you, if you don't do well, maybe you get into a smaller company, you get transferred to a, a lower position, so there is less retribution in terms of the reproach. It, it's kind of complicated. So the, the reproach was implicit, I think, uh, Jack, in a your sense that CEOs are turning over more quickly. So why, why is it the case that U.S., these activist U.S. shareholders who are turning these shares over so fast, they've let the compensation rise to this 20 million. They lay off, the CEOs are, are moving through faster. What's the, what, how do you explain the rise in the salary and also is it laying off, getting rid of the CEO, which is the main malice <laughs> adjustment? I have, I have to apologize a little bit. I was trying to do the calculation to see if I was underpaid per kilogram, and then I found out all my fellow CEOs are making $20 million. So I'm, I'm a little taken aback. I'm having a bad day. <laughs> American CEOs. American CEOs. <laughs> but the... Um, you know, I think it's, it's interesting. We have the new say-on-pay provisions in the United States, which admittedly are advisory. We've had them in the U.K. since 2002. And the statistics are very telling. Uh, only in 12 out of the first 100 companies to face the results had even as much as a 30% disagreement with what the pay schedules were. And in the U.K., the statistics have fluctuated between... 3% and 8% of people who wow. disagree. So, I, wow. so I, I don't know that the activist shareholders, they're concerned, but the typical investor, the one that's in there for 69 days or six months, I don't think they can they're care. They're not concerned. Having gone on hundreds, literally, of investor roadshows, wow. I'm rarely asked what I make. I'm rarely asked, is my board overpaid? I'm usually asked, what are you going to do this quarter? So I, I don't know that it's at the top of their list. It's certainly for some of the pension funds, who, in addition to being good investors, also have the political issues of representing labor unions and things like that. That's high on their radar in terms of executive pay. But I don't know that for a fact it's really high up on the list of, uh, of the average uh, so institutional the, investor. So the average institutional investor is okay with the $20 million. 
They, they don't, they're not, they don't well, share they get, the concern. Of, they get to say whether they are or not. But, but it turns out that... So far, there has not so been a huge outcry if not. the CEO, if she or he has been successful. Right. Then I think, and if he, she or he isn't, the new CEO, that's yeah. the... And I'd just like to address one other question you had. The question was, is anybody looking at making less money if you don't perform and more if you do? I think... There's been a tremendous movement, and I think the, you know, the bad cases make the bad law. The famous cases where there's been egregious overpayment uh, in connection with poor or disappointing performance. But I think more and more directors on outside compensation, outside directors on compensation committees are tying compensation to performance. And I think every compensation consultant out there in the name of their business and their reputation is driving companies more and more to that especially for the smaller or mid-cap companies. That's my observation. So, so one of the uh, problems that came up in the, in the period after, 19, in the mid-90s, late 90s, is we did adopt some tax law which encouraged firms to pay for performance. That is, over a million dollars of compensation, you had to have a pay-for-performance right. provision. Mm -hmm. what that, but the performance was the stock price. And... What do, you, what do you think happened? Uh, there's a lot of ways you can manipulate the stock price. There is a lot of earnings manipulation that can be attributed to tying compensation to one variable, which is the share price, mm -hmm. and not others. So now we're at the world of what do you tie it to? Right. What time period? What's the variable? Is it stock performance relative to the overall market, relative to the overall sector in which you're in? So. so yeah. I think we have moved more to performance, but we still have a problem of what is the performance we want to measure. Yeah, I think as you see the uh, uh, CDAs, the uh, discussion and analysis of compensation and prospectuses, right. you'll see that they, companies are tying it to more and more variables than just the stock yes. price because you yes. go through a period of 2008 and everybody's compensation scheme that's been laid for the next five years is, is blown apart. So I think you're seeing it on relative performance, as you mentioned. I think you're seeing it on EBITDA. Whatever the particular measures of that company are that make it a healthier company, I think compensation committees are much smarter today than they were in November of 2008. So, so Gil, you sit on the, uh, you do remuneration at CIDIC. Do any, uh, what are, the, you're hearing things about uh, what performance you look at. You're hearing things about war for talent, where, you know, the CEO of CIDIC could be competed away. How, how is this all playing into a, the considerations there. Yeah, th thanks, Laura. Uh, you know, I am restricted from commenting too much purely uh, sure. on CIDIC, but let me just move it out, though, yes. into, into the broad financial services sector. Fine. And to go back to the minister's question, some of the most egregious problems have been in the financial services sector with large financial companies. Yes. And Oliver Wyman, together with the uh, Institute of International Finance, just issued a report that said... Since 2007 until now, at least two things have been taken away that were a problem, which were parachutes, which parachutes. meant, you know, you're an executive, you basically mess up the bank, you get fired, but you go away with a lot of money. Okay, that <laughs> happened at the New York Stock Exchange earlier on, before you, Madhu, were there, obviously. Um, and the other one is guaranteed bonuses or compensation over a period of time, which were incentives to underperform. Yeah. because you already had your compensation. Those have been taken out of the system in the last two to three years, by and large, according to this recent survey by Oliver Wyman. In Asia, though, it's still an issue, uh, and uh, Oki was commenting on that, that the culture is one of compassion, mm -hmm. is one of less individualism. So um, the individual compensation is less based on total shareholder returns or total value creation, but more on, did you more or less do okay? Okay. Okay, were your revenues more or less in budget? Did you make a reasonable return on revenues? Did you make a reasonable return on equity? And the compensation then shines less. The West, and particularly the U.S., has the US. A, cu a culture of leadership that says, I'm going to transform, I'm going to create. I'm going to do something different, which is more or less what you are doing at Monex. Okay. But it is, you are much less the example mm -hmm. in Asia than the norm. And conversely, in the U.S. particularly, shareholders are looking at major transformation, major shareholder creation. If that happens on a risk-adjusted basis, then the they're prepared to compensate. 
But, it, but I think as uh, Jack suggested, a lot of these major transformations, particularly when in their form of mergers and acquisitions, don't actually work. So you, you, you bring someone in, give them a, a huge package, they're going to transform the country, company by doing this. So then what happens? Do you have any, uh, how do you um, penalize for bad behavior? You, you know, m- one of the things, you know, I'll add from an India example, which is sort of slightly different, the, and it's sort of, it's more a fact, the large institutional shareholders' awareness about compensation and, and, you know, all of these, you know, executive compensation, especially full-time executive compensation, has to go through a, share, a full shareholder resolution. It has to be passed. You'd be surprised that, you know, we just started off a new company uh, as a part of the group. Um, uh, the equivalent of ISS, what ISS does in the U.S., in, in, in institutional okay. shareholders' advisory services. And when we did some groundwork preparing for the start, launch of this company, we were really surprised how many of the large institutions even actually went through and read through these resolutions. Did so the, 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 the international guys may be, the international guys may be operating in their arm, but I would, I would sort of, you know, the, some of the larger guys and even the, the, the big stakeholders are not as actively involved as they are, let's say, in the U.S. or maybe, maybe in Europe. The, of course, the political system is, is, would, would have involvement in it, but that's one, one, big, one differential. On the, on, the, on, the, on the malfeasance side, I mean, I, maybe I'll just sort of add one, make the conversation a little, I think you're focusing a lot on, the, on senior management and, and, you know, I think in, in my personal case as well, I think we also have some challenges at the middle management as well. Okay. I think in Asia, which we can be talking before, and I agree to what you said, you know, it's the general, the first reaction is how can, can we actually, I hate to use, use the word, you know, how can we sort of, um, how can we solve the problem without being confrontational? And how can we give a, a graceful exit? How can we make sure the person, even for complete non-performance, how can we make sure the person can go with his, with his face intact? So I was just sort of, as you said, you know, we had, or, you know, I'll say that, that I've heard stories, and then, you know, even in our case, you know, we had an office, you know, there's an office somewhere in, in, in one corner of the country where the non-performers were being transferred to. No, you know, so you go. Okay, you're being, you know, you're being transferred to, you know, the, you know, one corner of the country, which is basically an indication that, you know, look, you're really doing badly, and you can now start looking for a job. And and and, and the inability of, I mean, I think one big differential in, 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 in at least in Asia, at least, and I used to also cover China a little bit, um, in the in, in the in the non-Western back entities, are in a sort of decisions and non-performance at the middle level is also going to be a, a challenge as we sort of build scale and as we start competing against the global guys. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can I make yes, one comment? Yes, please. I think there is a, a kind of geo-economical background okay. for the uh, uh, CEO's compensation. Uh, like in Japan, J- Japan is not really relevant these days, but, you know, uh, but the, this is a country it's I know very well. It's still a major economic okay. power, okay? It still is. <laughs> good, good example. J- Japan, for example, it's a very limited land. Very uh-huh. limited land. And we need to grow rice in the limited land. We need to harvest it. There's no big upside. There's always a downside, like a storm or you know, flood or tsunami or whatever. Mm-hmm. But upside is limited. So what is required for leader is to, 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 sa- to save the downside. Okay. Okay? Okay. In the States, it's very it's rich country. Upside. And you can yeah. go push the frontier and, uh-huh. uh, you know, go west and they get the new land and then, ooh, I got new <laughs> revenue. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of upside. Uh-huh. So uh, I think a leader is expected to go out to find a new upside and get paid. I think mm. in case of China, maybe when China was poor, when China was poor, it was maybe, although it's very, has got vast huge land, but maybe similar to Japan. Mm-hmm. But now, uh, China has got a very m- m- a huge number of uh, uh, the people who have got disposal income. Now mm-hmm. it's becoming like, uh, like the states. So that I think in China, the leadership is to expect it, expect it to you know, expand the business okay. and get rewarded. Mm-hmm. I think there is a, oh, some, that kind of... Uh, cultural or geographical background. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. How about here and here? It starts here. Yeah. Uh, we need a, a, a microphone. 
please introduce yourself. Maybe I'll take two questions and then we can so I'll take both of them. Hi, I'm from India, and I heard the panel in the morning, and there was talk about India and China, the wages going up by 15 to 20 percent. Now, with the 15 to 20 percent average compromise every year, how do we look at uh, mid-management to upper mid-management retention? Because, you know, we've spoken about top management quite a bit. And I think because India and China, the primary base is manufacturing, if you're going to have a 15 to 20 percent wage increase, whether it's top management, mid-management, Lower management will effectively be losing our competitiveness. So the question then is retention and compensation. Retention and compensation. Do you want to add to that and then we'll... Hi, I'm Tom Doctorow from uh, WPP. Um, on the cultural element, uh, uh, building on this, uh, in, in my experience in China, regardless of whether leaders are with state-owned enterprises or even multinationals, as a trend, leadership tends to be quite defensive and protective, not necessarily focused on long-term value creation. My question is, as salaries increase, and I'm not talking about uh, the state-owned enterprises or the local sectors, but for multinational uh, companies that are expected to abide by the same forms of corporate governance and value creation, irrespective of geography, mm -hmm. have you noticed a linkage in increased salary and a more forward-thinking, value-creation-driven senior leadership amongst uh, local candidates. I see. Okay. So, the, so why don't we start with, why don't we take those, uh, the second question first, because it's related, and then we'll go to the wage question, which I think is a very important question. But on this question of, are, I mean, really it is, if, if you are running, you're searching for talent, and you're a multinational here, and you're subject to all the multinational rules, how does that affect the kind of person you need here and the kind of reward structure that you offer here? Uh, do you do any, um, do you do any at Hydric sort of finding heads, CEOs for, for, for regions here that are part of multinationals and does that affect, uh, the, uh, does it change the kind of talent you're looking for? We're actually doing, uh, that's most of what we do. We do okay. mostly multinational searches in China. Okay. Um, we okay. do virtually nothing with the state-owned enterprises. Okay. And so, so the multinationals are, are putting a premium on, on talent. And uh, I, I think what, you know, the notion of value creation, this is where a lot of the significant upside is happening with the multinationals. This, this is where, where they're getting their organic growth. So this is where, right. earlier in my comments, where there's a scarcity of talent. We're, we're having a hard time completing searches to find Mm -hmm. the, uh, the right. talent that the multinationals are looking for in this region. And, and it's across consumer, financial services, industrial. Mm -hmm. um, they're just, they really just don't exist. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's the challenge. I think it's evolving, mm -hmm. but it's, it's still not there to run the multinationals. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge we face. Yeah, Gil. Yeah, um, at, uh, at Mercer, we're doing a lot of work with SASAC on executive compensation for their top leadership and I think you're right uh, that the emphasis is less on real shareholder value creation on a risk-adjusted basis. Risk-adjusted. Okay, it is just purely on are you going to more or less get the product out of the door? Are you going to get the uh -huh. revenue? Are you going to get the expense? Uh -huh. So there's clearly a lot of ways to go. And that's what I was referring to earlier on, that the private companies really are looking for their own self-value creation because they're basically run by the key original shareholder that, that started it up. Okay, and that we're seeing then the significant difference between compensation in the SOEs and compensation in the private Chinese companies, many multiples. To go back to the lady that works with my friend Kashaf, okay, the, um, the multiples mm -hmm. in executive compensation to say a new entrant from university in Asia are 20 times. So not only are we seeing that senior executive compensation is rising very quickly in Asia compared with uh, the growth in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the West, mm -hmm. is that if you take a new entrant, you have to have that person go through, if that person is going to eventually be a, a chief executive, 20 times that compensation. And you clearly cannot make that on a 3% annual salary increase. And this is an issue that many multinationals face when working in Asia, particularly in China, which is the parent company back in Frankfurt or London or, or Pittsburgh says, okay, you know, we have a flat market, annual salary increases are 0 or 1%. 
And so the whole world has to implement that, including emerging markets like India and like China. And of course what happens is these multinationals hire very capable, bright people from go. the universities, and after they get trained for three years, you lose them and they go, you go to train they your go. competition. Right. Mm -hmm. So it is important to then bring in a compensation program, people to rise much more quickly in emerging markets, particularly those that are hot. Why not just raise the, uh, solve that problem a little bit by reducing the, the starting gap? What, how can you attribute, let's say offering uh, a premium for the, the outstanding uh, MBA students to come in at a gap that's more like 15 to rather than 20? <laughs> yeah, the, the issue there is that, you know, India is producing what it is, uh, one and a half million university yeah, graduates know, a year. China is three million, so there is an enormous pool. Supply from which you then hire, and you don't know the real future performance uh -huh. of an individual until you're sort of three years into the run. So you need, okay. okay. So, you know, it's, it's an issue. Yeah. What I've, anecdotally, what I've heard from the IT sector, there are even the engineers who come out of engineering schools, yes. the amount of training they have to go through I before know. they become deployable mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in, in a project could be between six to 12 months Anywhere, I mean, in that sort of, I mean, I, you know, yeah, and, and similarly in the financial, in the entire BFSI space, the financial services space. So what is, what the product coming out of the university system needs significant amount of training. And as Rafael says, I mean, bridging that gap is, is, is huge. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, and, this, and also the standard, there's not much standardization of the, of the, of the student coming out of an, of, of an engineering school in, you know, in the country. I mean, there are, there's huge differentials. Mm -hmm. uh, but didn't, I, as I recall, uh, we, I teach a course on emerging markets and we you know, occasionally look at uh, cases and one of the cases, like many cases have been written about emphasis. And my, my understanding is that they have, you know, you get hired there at a premium. You, they're, they're very aggressive uh, training programs, but you still get hired. To get that job means you get a premium relative to the market. And then the struggle is to, to keep them uh, while you train them. But, but some companies do decide to go into that market of supply and still choose to pay a premium price. I think Goldman does that in uh, <laughs> probably in any market that it, uh, it acquires talent in. It's always paying above uh, the market for the new talent. So, um, do you, How do you respond to that issue? You're, you're a, a, a firm, an entrepreneurial firm in Japan. It, uh, do you look for talent differently? I mean, you've described the general situation in Japan, but when you're looking for your talent, are you looking for uh, more transformational talent, more of your defensive talent? Um, and do you, um, say, track more to multinational competition in your field or more to the domestic marketplace? How do you do that? Well, we, clearly, we need more tigers in my company, for example. More what? Tigers, not cats. We need more, we need more, you know, So you're, you're a company of tigers. Well, you know, uh, we, we hope to be. You hope to but be. But it's not easy like because... So you're not representative. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the problem is like a multinational company like Goldman Sachs, mm -hmm. they pay a premium in, in, in the, in, in the, the labor, labor market, especially for young people. Yeah, especially for young And young people, they don't, they don't, they can't think about his or her life for, you know, coming 20 years. They, they look at how much they get paid yeah. today, uh -huh. and then they go to the, the, those, those companies. Okay. There is a huge vacuum of talent in Japan huge to those industries. Mm -hmm. Not manufacturers, not no. you know, more entrepreneurial, you know, value, new value creation industry, uh, uh, segments, mm -hmm. but to investment bank. Oh. Well, I'm from investment bank originally, so I'm not, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to say bad thing about them, but they don't really create new values. Right? They're basically, you know, they, they can help, but they don't produce uh, the values, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, I, 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 I may be wrong, but, but anyway. Uh, I'm looking so, at but, it with some skepticism, I way. <laughs> but there's a huge vacuum of uh, talents, and, uh, which I'm very worried about, very worried about. <laughs> what about this issue of, uh, your, your question was really also about wage pressure and competitiveness. My, my reaction as an economist to that was to say, well, productivity is rising very fast, so wages can rise. And of course, there is exchange rates as another variable. So, e so there's room for significant 
wage growth in a place like China because productivity growth has been uh, in advance of wage growth for a long time without an erosion of competitiveness. But I, I, do you get any sense of, do you worry about this in the countries you're working in, that somehow they're going to price themselves out of being in a competitive position? I do. When you do? Yeah. When for me, that's the problem. I, because, you know, we, we are trying to do a transformation in, in my current role. Mm -hmm. and, and the primary drivers are going to be people who come, who come from outside. We've, got, we've been able to recruit a very reasonably good senior team. By, uh, and, and, uh, but now when we start going to the middle management, I just, I'm, just, I'm struggling. Because I've got some good people, but the wages are just skyrocketing in two years. And, and, and to Oki's point, and somebody comes in and pays extra, like, you know, you know two, three, four percent. And, these, and, and, I, and, and they move. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it is, it, it's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't have the, the, the wherewithal to make the investments like Infosys does or Goldman does, then we sort of, we get squeezed out. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So, yeah, I'm going to go back there. I'm going to... Uh, uh, I think you have to wait to put our earphones uh, on uh, so uh, we understand. Uh, 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 地方政府性债务的担心，他们准备在未来两年，呃，要调低中国的政府的信用。呃，我想问在座的几位嘉宾，对于这个问题怎么看待？谢谢。the question was about uh, the potential, it hasn't happened, uh, possible downgrading of at least some of the local government debt in China. But I think in order to link that to this discussion, uh, we really should talk about, and we haven't, uh, so it's important. Sta you talked about the importance of state-owned enterprises. We talked about the importance of different kinds of companies. There are a lot of very significant economic development going on in all around China, not necessarily in state-owned enterprises, but in enterprises that, that have a very substantial base locally. Do you see any local differences, uh, east, uh, eastern regions, western regions, large, smaller cities, uh, in terms of compensation uh, developments? Yeah, Laura, um, clearly uh, the, 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 the question asked by the gentleman is outside of this topic, but I think you have very nicely brought it into the question of compensation. Um, if compensation rises above productivity, clearly over time that is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. you know, Europe is in that situation, okay, because they just had a ratcheting up of compensation. The U.S. is a lot more flexible. Asia is coming up from below, you know, and there are risks that in certain sectors that, that rises. If that happens, then the risk that things will be mismanaged and that the performance will, over time, not really reflect value creation uh, may result in a loss of uh, the quality, and that will be recognized by the uh, rating agencies if they do their job properly. One of the ways that you want to address that is by moving compensation away from just being cash, which is what it is in Asia mostly today, and maybe a bonus, okay. towards something that is long-term value creation. Okay. And in that regard, the U.S. has been leading, uh, has been leading the field in the report by Oliver Wyman, basically they found that practically all of the 37 largest financial institutions on a global basis have moved into putting a significant part of compensation yes. into long-term incentives. Okay. In China, out of the 300 companies in the Hushen Index, which is the combined index of Shenzhen and Shanghai Stock Exchanges, only about 15% of those have established long-term incentives. Wow. So clearly, until that gets in place, there is the risk of what the gentleman is asking. John, could I ask a question of you on China? Uh, you, you talked about the importance of venture capital in the United States and also the particular compensation structure in venture capital. Do you see that as an important driver in China or any place else in Asia at Absolutely. this point? So do, do you see comparable compensation structures developing in that part of the economy? Well, look, I think that in China, 
and I think also in India. Uh, the top venture capitalists are very aggressive in these markets, and that's where the real wealth creation happens. Uh, look, we, we did the CEO search to put Eric Schmidt into Google, and I looked him up on Forbes, and he was worth six and a half billion dollars. Mm -hmm. But 20,000 jobs were created. Look, I think that the majority of, of job creation and wealth creation is going to come from that asset class. And, and historically, they come in with low, low bases. You make a lot of sacrifice. And if you can use good judgment, I mean, one of the things that venture capital does, you know, they go through a model where you have series A, series B, series C, series D. So they capitalize the business. So they'll, they'll give the management team a finite amount of capital. You hit your milestones. You, you deliver against those goals. And from there, they, they, they give you funding for the next level. And so it's, it's a, a series of funding events that get you, if you do a good enough job, you get it to the public markets. And if you're successful enough in leading that business to get it to the public markets, it's a windfall for all the employees. Okay? And this is where you know, the high potentials out of Goldman or the high potentials out of Morgan Stanley or an industrial business are going and flocking to businesses like this where they get equity ownership coming in at entry-level, mid-level positions. But, John, can you, is that a model that is, you can use to attract talent it's in a China? Huge, it's a very powerful model. In China? It, it is absolutely okay. being done in China. And India? I'm it sure. is also being done in India. Yeah. As, as a matter like of fact, in, in, so in, in Mobi is a client or a company, and that's the fastest-growing company in the world. Okay. Period. End of story, and it's based in India. As a matter of fact, we, the government has actually just uh, got, announced a policy which will set up the first SME exchange in the country. A, a, a model on the NASDAQ, okay. which will give an opportunity for companies in a much earlier stage to also go to the public markets. To go to the public markets, right. Yeah. So let me conclude with you, Oki. Did you, in this transition from, a, from Goldman to an entrepreneurial venture, uh, did you have venture funding? Did you act like a venture capitalist? How, did you, have, you, have you compensated your employees in this more uh, forward wealth creation kind of way that John's talked about? Well, I have tried. I made some mistakes, I'm, I'm trying again. But at the end of the day, we have to move on that, that, that direction. Otherwise, uh, I don't think uh, we can create uh, good value for, mm -hmm. for the company and for the uh, all stakeholders. But in terms of, say, the acceptance of, an, of a venture capital compensation, take risks, get rewarded later, relative to how you started when you were talking about the, the standard socio, the, the cultural norms in China, is it hard to find people who are willing to be in that kind of compensation mode, to take on those kinds of jobs? Well, people need to get how to accustomed to those mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, the options or whatever, sometimes people think that is a, some people fear that is a, a ownership of the company. And some people feel this is just a, just a bonus, right? So we need to somehow get through those kind of period for those uh, 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 compensation structures are okay. well, well taken in, mm -hmm. taken in to those uh, people. I think. Okay. All right. Jack, do you have anything uh, you want to say on this topic? Or I, I guess I was going back to the gentleman's question about sure. the uh, ratings of. Oh, I the guess, ratings. I right. guess when I came to China on Monday, the furthest worry from my mind was the downgrading of Chinese debt. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think you know, ratings agencies do a wonderful job of measuring how much debt you have and what the assets are, but they don't necessarily and couldn't measure what you do with the debt. Mm -hmm. And I think China, from hearing the Premier speak the last couple of days, has a moment in time where wisely using that capital puts it in a position for many, many years to come. So I think that... Uh, I'm still a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I want to thank our panel. We've run out of time. Uh, this was, I think, as, as we tried to make it, very objective, very analytical, very cross-cultural. Thank you very much for a fascinating discussion.